everyone, Corvo Capital here. Today we're going to be looking at coastal landscapes in the UK. As always, grab your worksheet from your uh, geography teacher and get filling in those definitions before you watch the video so that you can mark your answers and learn what you need to revise. So first of all, we're talking about coastal landscapes. What is a landscape? Well, a landscape is a large area of land regarded as being physically and visually distinct. What does that mean? Well, it means that visually and physically that landscape has certain landforms uh, so for example in this human landscape the human layer we can see that it has roads uh, or buildings or infrastructure like electricity pylons that make it distinct different whereas in the biological layer you might have rivers or trees or mountains that make that a landscape it's physically different to the other area around it and when we talk about the uk having a diverse range of landscapes all we mean is that it has a variety or lots of different landscapes. So for example, we're looking at coastal landscapes, but you've also looked at the river landscapes that the UK has, and you've also looked at UK cities. They're also a landscape. Okay, upland areas are areas that are high above sea level. So we're talking hills uh, in the locally in the West Midlands, but in Scotland and Wales and north of England, mountains as well. Whereas lowland areas, those are areas that are close to or below sea level. A famous one is the Fens in South Cambridgeshire um, in the southeast of England. River systems. So river systems is just another name for a drainage basin. So that includes the river from source to mouth and all of the landforms, so the waterfalls, the meanders, uh, the estuaries along it. And river systems are important because they feed into the coast providing sediment um, that has been eroded, eroded material. So physical processes, when we're talking about physical processes, we're just talking about processes that are natural forces. They're naturally occurring. They're not uh, caused by humans. Examples that we're going to look at, erosion, transportation, depossession and weathering. So weathering, weathering. it's important to know the difference between weathering and erosion. So weathering is the wearing away of something, usually rocks, that is in situ. That just means it's not moving, it's stationary. A really easy example, a cliff face or a brick wall on the school playground. When it's built, it's really nice and new. After weathering, so it's not erosion because it's not moving, it's a brick wall. But after lots of weathering, lots of breaking down in, in situ, it's not going to look as nice and fresh and new. And we can split it into three different types of weathering. The first one is mechanical weathering. I like to think of this as a mechanic works as the different parts of a car. A mechanical weathering is the physical disintegration of rocks breaking up into their different parts. Importantly, there's no chemical reaction going on. So it's just a rock being broken into their mechanical parts. This example is freeze thaw weathering, does what it says on the tin. So water in cracks in rocks freezes overnight when we have diurnal temperature variation. It's warm in the day, cold at night. So at night it freezes and it expands a little bit around about 15%. That opens that crack a little bit until the day when it, the water melts again uh, and the crack uh, stays uh, slightly wider and fills with more water. That water is then going to freeze again at night and this process keeps on happening until the rock has completely disintegrated. And we call the little bits that are left at the end scree. So freeze thaw weathering, just went through it, but it's a common process of weathering, particularly in glacial, glacial environments. The idea of the water freezing, expanding, widening the crack in the night, and then in the day melting, filling back up with water, and then happening again. Chemical weathering, so this is the decomposition of rock by a chemical change. A really classic example, uh, so rainwater is slightly acidic, and that acid, when it falls onto limestone at the coastline, that leads to the rocks being dissolved in a chemical reaction and forming calcium carbonate. Mass movement, so mass movement is the downhill movement of weathered material under the force of gravity. So once that material has been weathered, then gravity is slowly going to pull it down a slope. We have four types, a rock fall, a mud flow, a landslide, and a rotational slip, which we usually call slumping. So the first one is sliding. Uh, sliding is loose surface material becomes saturated, so we get lots of rain onto a slope like this, and the extra weight of the water that's been absorbed by whatever it is, it could be mud, could be sand, 
could be rocks, makes it unstable, and that means that it moves downhill. It was a big risk at Lyme Regis. Slumping, so this is the rapid mass movement of a whole segment of cliff. So as you can see here, it's not individual rocks or mud that are moving, a whole segment, and it gives it this kind of terraced appearance. Again, due to saturated, um, saturated slope. So lots of rain has happened, it's made this cliff unstable, and large segments of the cliff have moved. Rock fall, this is slightly different. So this is when fragments of rock break away from the cliff face, often due to freeze or weathering. So you can see the little bits of scree that have broken off, falling down the uh, cliff face. A nice way I think of this is rock falls happen much faster than say a mudslide, for example. Okay, erosion. Erosion, different to weathering, because this is the wearing away and removal of material by a moving force. So this time it's not stationary. And when we're thinking about the coast, that moving force is 99.9% of the time is going to be a wave, probably a destructive wave. We've got four types, abrasion, attrition, solution, and hydraulic action. So hydraulic action, sometimes called hydraulic power, is the process of breaking waves, compressing pockets of air in cracks. So think of that pushing motion of the waves pushing into cracks. The pressure causes those cracks to widen, and over time, the rock is going to break. It's the most powerful form of erosion. Abrasion, this is slightly different. So our waves, because of how powerful they are, have a lot of energy and they can carry fairly large rocks and pebbles. When the waves swash, they throw these pebbles at the cliff face and that wears away the cliff face. I always think of the S standing for sandpaper, so it's going to scrape away the cliff face. Attrition, so that tut tut sound, uh, tut -tut sound sounds like two rocks colliding. So it's when rocks in seawater collide with each other and generally they become more rounded and smaller. So if you find small round pebbles on a beach, that just means they've been carrying out attrition for a long time. Transportation, so transportation is the movement of sediment by um, waves, that could be sand, but could also be rocks. And one example of that is longshore drift. Longshore drift is this zigzag movement of sediment along the coastline, and that's caused by two things. The first one, the prevailing wind, which in the UK comes from the southwest, pushes those waves onto the beach at an angle. So you can see they're all hitting the beach at an angle. But under the force of gravity, think of the waves going back into the sea, rolling down the beach, the waves come straight back. So the backwash comes straight back. So what we get is this pattern of because of the wind, the swash is at an angle, gravity, the backwash comes straight back. Wind at an angle, backwash straight back because of gravity. And over time, sediment drifts, we call it longshore drift. So a piece of material that starts its journey here will eventually be transported or moved to this side of the beach. The prevailing wind mentioned is the most common wind. So the prevailing wind is the most common wind, the wind that blows most often. From the, in the UK, it comes from the southwest. And that means that the swash hits the beach at an angle. Deposition. So you'll all have done a demonstration in your lessons with somebody carrying loads of books until they run out of energy and drop them. And waves are exactly the same. So when the sea loses energy, deposition happens, the dropping of material. They drop what they're carrying. This can lead to the change in shape of the, la uh, of the coastal landscape. So we can have a spit forming if our spit connects to headlands, then we can get a bar forming, and if our spit connects the mainland to an island, we call that a tombola. Okay, sediment, so sem sediment is simply small pieces of rock. It could be as tiny as sand, but it can also be uh, a bit larger, uh, or pebbles that are a bit larger. Along the coastline, you get tiny pieces of rock called sand, uh, and we call those larger rocks, generally we call them shingles, so we can say that we've got a shingle beach. When we're talking about the coast, coast is where the land meets the sea. An estuary, so estuary is the tidal mouth of a river, that means that it has a high tide and a low tide. It's generally made up of wide banks of deposited mud, and it's also known as where fresh water meets uh, salt water, and we often call that brackish water. The rock type, or another word that we use, geology, refers to the type of rock that we have. That can include the strength of the rock, and how it's been formed, whether it's sedimentary, metamorphic, or igneous. Generally, we are concerned with soft rocks like clay because they're eroded to form bays, and hard rocks like limestone because they're eroded more slowly, and so they stick out to sea as 
headlands. So, headlands and bays. So, headlands and bays are found along discord of coastlines where we have alternating bands of hard and soft rock. So, alternating hard, soft, hard, soft. And they jet out to sea. So, a bay is this concave shape where the land has been eroded uh, because there was soft rock there, so it's eroded quite quickly. Whereas the headlands stick out to sea because they're probably made of a hard rock like limestone. Uh, where the destructive waves haven't been able to erode it as quickly, so they're left to stick out to sea. This one is Low Earth Cove in the southwest of the UK. Cliffs, so these are basically just a steep rock face, particularly at the edge of land that faces sea, so we find a lot of them at the coast. So unlike a slope where we get mass movement, generally cliffs are very steep. Wave cut platforms. So a wave cut platform is a rocky uh, level shelf at or around sea level representing the base of all the treated cliffs. So at the bottom of this cliff here, you can see a wave cut platform. What would have happened is it would have started as a wave cut notch, which you can see there. But over time, continued erosion, such as hydraulic action, will have undercut that cliff. The cliff will eventually collapse, but leaving behind a little bit of a platform uh, that was covered by the sea, the waves will uh, attack the base of the cliff again, and over time as the cliff retreats, it leaves a platform which gets smoothed by attrition. Okay, so when a headland erodes, we often get, well, first of all, we get cracks, which are tiny cracks, which might get attacked by hydraulic action. Then we get caves, which are a large hole in a cliff caused by marine processes, such as hydraulic action and abrasion, force their way into cliffs and uh, carve out or break down a uh, hollow in the cliff that we call a cave. If that cave could, it still gets eroded by abrasion and hydraulic action, it will erode all the way through, leaving an arch shape. Often, as the arch gets eroded by marine and sub-aerial processes, then uh, it will collapse, so the weight of the unsupported area of the arch will collapse, and that will leave behind a stack. That's an isolated pillar of rock, so rock on its own, stands away from the headland and is usually about the same height as the headland. You can see an example here um, on the board. Our example of that is Old Harry Rocks in Dorset. Coastal landscape. So coastal landscapes are an area extensive land found where the land meets the sea. So we talked about landscapes being distinct or different. Coastal landscapes are different because it's where land meets the sea. Hard engineering, so really important. Hard engineering is using concrete or large artificial structures, another way of thinking of is man-made, uh, man to protect against physical processes like erosion and flooding. Uh, some examples that we've got, for examples, a sea wall. It, uh, it's again exactly the same as it sounds, it's a concrete wall aimed to prevent the erosion of the coast by reflecting wave energy. So the waves are less powerful in terms of erosion because the energy, energy is being reflected back. This is a recurved seawall, which is even better because it prevents uh, erosion from eroding the base of the cliff as the energy is deflected upwards. Rock armour, these are large boulders that are dumped on a beach to absorb wave energy and reduce coastal erosion and flooding. This rock armour looks pretty organised, but sometimes when rock armour is a bit less organised, we call it riprap. Gabion, so this is similar to rock armour, but a cheaper um, and faster alternative. So these are gabions, they are steel cages that are filled with stones, usually really resistant hard rocks, and they get stacked along the coastline to prevent erosion, cliff collapse, and also flooding. And finally, groins. Groins are slightly different uh, because they are not really designed to prevent uh, erosion. So a wooden rock or barrier, so groins used to be made out of wood, they're usually made out of rock or concrete now, and they stick out to the sea, a little bit like our headlands, and they're designed to stop longshore drift. So they're designed to stop sand moving from this side of the beach to that side of the beach, preventing longshore drift. Then, soft engineering. A few examples of what soft engineering is coming up, but first of all, soft engineering is working with the coast in an ecologically sensitive way. It's about using natural materials to help restore beaches in a way that is sensitive to the environment. So, beach nourishment, uh, one of my favourites, sometimes called beach regeneration, is the process of adding new material to a beach artificially by dumping large amounts of sand or shingle. You can see that these JCBs kind of diggers here are moving sand onto this beach where it's been eroded away. 
We can also have dune or sand dune regeneration, which involves building up sand dunes and increasing vegetation to prevent the coast from retreating. So all they've done here is plant some of this grass, it's called marron grass. And what it does is it acts as that obstacle, first of all, to stimulate the sand dunes to start to collect and the deposition to occur, but they also hold the sand dunes uh, together so they don't blow away in a storm. Managed retreat, this is also known as the do nothing approach which is the controlled retreat of the coastline. By controlled, we mean that people let it happen, often allowing flooding to occur over low-lying, low-value land, like farmland. What this means is that we can kind of cut our losses with this uh, land here, and we can give the people that live there or own that land some compensation, but then we don't end up wasting money building seawalls and gabions and groins or regenerating sand dunes that ultimately in the future are going to need replacing anyway. When we talk about coastal management, all we're talking about really is stopping or preventing erosion and flooding. So all of the hard engineering and soft engineering strategies are example of coastal management, ways of preventing flooding and erosion. Finally, um, sorry, our example of this is uh, Lime Regis where they built a uh, seawall and also uh, some groins and also some rock armour to prevent the erosion and flooding of the, the local tourist town. Conflict, this is really common in coastal landscapes uh, landscapes because I'm talking about, well usually we're talking about the needs of tourism because the UK co coasts are a massive tourist hotspot with the needs of local residents that live in the area. So different groups might disagree and when different groups have a different opinion or they disagree we call that conflict. For example, tourists might disagree with ecologists that sand dunes need to be left alone instead of exploited for economic development. So, now that you've got all the definitions, make sure you've got them down in green pen. Use your sheet to find out what you don't know. And if you're not sure, have a look at the Coastal Landscapes playlist in the paper one section of the channel.